Well, it's a great crowd. Thank you and welcome. Uh, this is the Lebanon Community, uh, Lebanon, I almost said Community Foundation, Wayne. <laughs> Lebanon Museum Foundation kickoff. And uh, obviously everybody's here because you know why, or hopefully you know why, uh, that we've started a new effort uh, to have a museum here in Lebanon. There's been several efforts. Uh, we've found in research, there was one way back even in the 1900s uh, to, to start a museum here. We had one as recently as the 70s, and that was with the photographer Egan, uh, James Egan, and some other folks that were trying to do a museum. And then there was the most recent one was a group of people, and um, uh, one of the gentlemen passed away that was on the board, and they've since disbanded last year. I think it was 2017. So that was the last effort that was made. Um, as mayor, I just felt that it was something that uh, I should really promote because it's something I've always wanted to see in Lebanon and I've been surprised. It's such hearing such cool stories from people that have lived here all their lives. And it's something I, I just want to see shared and continue because once the people that are telling these stories are gone, our stories are gone and we don't have anything to remember that with. So um, we started a committee uh, through city council and the committee met a few times and we immediately realized that we needed to start a foundation and we started a nonprofit foundation called the Lebanon Museum Foundation and the Lebanon Museum will be a part of that uh, organization. So we've got a board of directors and we've got a set of bylaws and we've got our articles of incorporation and we also have our uh, director, our board of directors, um, uh, the uh, president, vice president. So I'll just tell you, I want to introduce the group so you can know. Uh, in fact, if you guys wouldn't mind that are on the board, if you would come up here just so everybody can see uh, as I call your name. So uh, I'm Paul Aziz and I'm the president. Uh, Alan Collins is our vice president. Alan, raise your hand there. There's Alan, he's vice president. Uh, secretary is Jamie Cates and Jamie's right over there. And our treasurer is Nicole Bowman and there's Nicole. And we've got Kendra from the library. Uh, Wayne Rieskamp here, and Tony Marakawa there, dressed in her 1850s, is it? Yeah. Yep. And, all right. And Linda Zedrick. Where's There's Linda. And this is our board, and I'll tell you, this board has been fantastic to work with. Uh, we created a board, we got our bylaws, we did all these things in a matter of about two months, and it has been fast, and there's a lot of knowledge and a lot of learning and I just appreciate everything that all of you guys have done uh, to help and we're moving forward and we are excited to have you here. We're excited to share this with you. Um, our kickoff today is gonna be with Tony Farquet and he's gonna talk about the real original settlers that were here, uh, the Native Americans, the Kalpuya tribe and uh, that is really where our history starts. It's not just the settlers coming here, that's important, but it's the people who were here originally on this land and who were here before us. So I think it's gonna be pretty darn exciting. You guys can sit down, thanks. Um, so where are we right now? Right now, the first questions I know that you're gonna ask is, where's it gonna be? We don't have a location. <laughs> and when can I turn my stuff in? Those are the two big questions. And we don't have that yet available. This is still really, really early, um, but I'll tell you what we've done. We have visited four museums in the area. We've learned a whole lot from those visits. I wanted us to not reinvent the wheel. I wanted us to use what the other museums have done. And the board was the same way. We want, might as well get advantage, take advantage of what they've learned. And the number one thing that we learned is that we don't wanna take a bunch of things that we're not gonna display. That's gonna be the hardest thing to do. So we're creating our accession policy or our collections policy so that the things that come in are things that we would want and not too many of certain kinds of things. Uh, little egg beaters or something, you know, if there's 20 of them, it, it's just not that exciting. And then once the museum gets them, you can't get rid of them easily. So what we find is that some of these museums have 90% of their collection is in storage. And, and that's what we find in most of them. So they have all this extra stuff. And the biggest complaint is on the old stuff that they can't get rid of because it looks bad to the community because you've entrusted this group to hold on to the important things that matter to people. So these are things we're working on, our collections policy. So what we're asking from the community right now is one, we need donations because we need some money to be able to get started and get things going. 
uh, from administrative and just getting our 501c3. Uh, right now, the city is able to accept donations on our behalf, so you can donate uh, to the city and we can accept donations. And we have a donation form over here if you're interested. Uh, and the city will hold that in uh, trust for us. And then um, also, uh, we're, as we're creating the collections policies and stuff, the next thing that's gonna be is we're gonna be ready to take stuff once we have our collection policies ready. And then now where are we gonna put the stuff? So we're looking for a location that we could store things at. So that's another thing that you could help us with is to help us find a location that would either donate it or it would be very inexpensive for us. And we're looking for something that's kind of like an office space, uh, something where maybe people uh, are at, like that they're working or living, because that usually is the same kind of thing that you want to keep your museum items in, where it's climate control, that's not extremely hot, it's not extremely cold, uh, and also, you know, th there's not a big fire danger there. You know, somebody's outside storage locker is not a great place for this, for the things that we're going to collect. So we, we were looking for a place. And then, of course, we're going to look for a building or a place, and we don't have that in mind yet. There's been a lot of discussion on that yet, but we're still real early. We want to get these foundational things done first so that we just don't start collecting a bunch of stuff that just isn't interesting to people. Uh, the goals of the museum is going to be a dynamic museum, not just static, so that you go in once and then you don't want to come back for 10 years because it's not that interesting and it never changes. It's going to be constantly changing. We want to kind of mimic the way that the library does, make it very active, make it interactive with the kids and with people so that we're always having events and things are changing and displays are changing. So uh, this isn't going to be an old time museum that just sits there and just collects dust. It's actually going to be very, very active and um, very responsive to the community. And we want to include the community in it too. That's one of the reasons for this meeting is to hear from people and find out uh, what you're looking for in a museum. Our mission statement is to preserve, educate, and engage the community in the history and the culture of the Lebanon area. So right now we need a location for the storage, a location for the museum. We're all, we are going to look for volunteers, we're not right this second, but we do need those. So anybody who's interested, we have a form that you can fill out, we can get some volunteers. Okay. Is there any questions? Maybe I'll just, just take a couple questions if there's any questions. because I tried to answer everything that, that most people have been asking us. And the big thing is, can you take my stuff? And where's it going to be? Those are the two big things. And I, and I know, and that we're excited about that too. And it's really difficult because it's getting to the point where people are literally coming and dropping stuff off on my doorstep right now. So <laughs> it's just not the great way to do it. <laughs> but uh, OK, anyways, with, with that, um, I want to introduce Tony Farke, and he is an excellent, excellent archaeologist and historian of the area, and he is going to talk about the original settlers here, the Kalkuya. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Mayor Paul. Back in 1929, three miles from this location, there was a rancher who was cleaning out a spring. The things that ranchers do. We all do things like that from time to time. And a rather large mammal bone turned up out of the sidewall of the spring work that he was doing to enhance his spring for so he could water his cattle. He contacted Lamont University. They determined it was a mammoth bone. Subsequent investigations of that site by Willamette University turned up what appeared to be a tool associated with a mammoth tooth and a mammoth tusk that came also from that same location. And the tool was made out of bone. It was like a, like a bone chisel. So they called 
Dr. Luther Crespin from the University of Oregon, the guy who found the sandals in the cave in Fort Rock, Oregon's first running shoes, they're 9,000 years old. He came in 1940, and he determined, indeed it was a tool, the bone tool was a chisel that had been manufactured. And also in that site, in association with other large mammal remains, another mammoth tooth and some more bone fragments, we found some stone tools made out of the same material as this. They called it chalcedony at that time. We call it crystalline silica or jasper from the rivers which had been modified definitely and been used. And, they, and they, at that time, it was a very early corroboration of human activity with Ice Age fauna, animals that were here 10,000 years ago. Tools, bones, same location, interspersed, right together. So that concluded, that was part of the story that concluded the, his analysis, which is a really early indication for the antiquity of cultural use of this, this location, Three Mouse is not very far away. It was on the South San Juan River, just up on a bench, just off, off the river terrace. So there's a story there, isn't there? Where are those artifacts? Where's that story? That's the kind of thing, if you have a facility in place, you have a place to carefully curate and care for and preserve the things that were available from a story beginning like that. And then teach and educate the people as to what happened in this location. So there was a lot of work to do. In 1841, the US Army sent an expedition down the Willamette Valley to see what the heck was out here. The Wilkes Expedition of 1841. They recorded in their notes, the Indians were burning them out, trying to smoke them out in October of 1841. And they didn't feel welcomed at all, and they moved out. Before they left, they made drawings of the valley facing east from the Central Valley, looking this direction. And it looks like a big park. It's all open with ribbons of trees and vegetation along the stream courses and along the Willamette River. Other than that, it was open prairie. There weren't any tractors. There wasn't any herbicides, no, no metal tools. How did that happen? There's a story there. It's this area. So you, you could have a museum that not only captured the tools and the remains of animals from the old days and told that first story, or that retold the story of early exploration of the area with replica replication of those maps and those reports, and then engage the original inhabitants, descendants, the tribes of today, to try to figure out what the Wilkes expedition meant when they said the Indians were trying to burn them out in 1841. Early record, the first record by Europeans, of the extensive, frequent, low intensity burning of the landscape for cultural purposes. They weren't trying to burn out the army. They were doing what they'd done for thousands of years, and the army just happened to time their expedition down the valley at that time when the tribes were definitely burning. So there's a lot of stories to tell. The Kalapuya story is an interesting one. I've been studying for 40 years here in this area, and it's a rich, deep, cultural history. We all want to know the story of human beings, don't we? Because that's who we are. The questions I get most often are, who was here? How long were they here? Where were they really here? What were they doing exactly in the different locations? What did they eat? What did they believe? What happened to them? All the questions of inquiry. So we're going to talk a little bit about that from what we've learned from the archaeology that's been done, finding things, and it's complex. You know, these things, this is old, and this is old. 
This is probably 4,000 years old. It's a hand axe. It would fit your hand just perfectly. Like this. For chopping out soft wood. Or cleaning out a cedar platter that you were, had to burn and you wanted to smooth it out and finish it off. Or the inside of a canoe. Fishing weight. Or is it a wrench or a screwdriver? <laughs> it takes a little bit of context and understanding and study to know what you have. But there's a lot of things available out there to, to look for. So we think that given the early association right here in Lebanon, three miles from here, of human activity with mammoth bones, the mammoths became extinct when? It gives us a good indication. When mammoths were here, well, it gives us a time frame, doesn't it? 10,000 years ago, plus or minus. A long time ago. They didn't make it through the great climate change, which was radical. Something happened to the planet that shifted it. And we had a very quick, rapid climate change across much of the Earth's surface. And the mammoth did not survive that very well at all. In a few places, they had some pygmy mammoths that survived in some locations in Alaska and down and off the California coast. But the large Columbia mammoths that were here didn't make it. That's another question. Why would you be hunting mammoths? They're so big. They're elephant size. I'm not sure they're all that tranquil. They might be kind of hard to harness up and ride. <laughs> so were you going to use them to plow the ground? How'd they, how'd they clear that land all off? You know? Well, the mammoths are like a hardware store. The hides are useful for armor for shoes, for shields. If you find a woolly mammoth in the high country, you can use their hair, which is three foot long, to sleep in. Make nice cradles for your children. It's quite useful. Weave it together into capes. You can use the teeth for grinding and carving you can, and crushing. You want to crush up bones to get the marrow out. Mammoth teeth are great crushing devices, absolutely. The bones can be made into all kinds of cutting tool, tools. This is a bone knife. You know what you're doing with bone. You can make it into a good skinning knife. It's got an antler handle, of course. What's that on there? A bison. How far would the Kalapuya Indians have to go to hunt bison? Or what we call the buffalo. If you're going to get the plains bison, you have to go clear over the Rocky Mountains, don't you? But there was a mountain bison that lived as far west as Sisters, Oregon, as late as 1500. It didn't have the huge herds groups of 30 or 40 at a time living up in the mountain valleys. So the Kalapuyans could have very likely gone on a bison hunt on foot. So the bones of the mammoths are, are useful. The tusks are useful for building structures. They're very nice. And how many mammoth burgers are in a mammoth? <laughs> Lots, that's right. You say, like, you've eaten mammoth. Have you been to Russia? <laughs> if, you, if you go to Russia today, they pull the mammoths out of the freezing glaciers that are melting back, and they, and they cook the mammoth and they serve it to you for a hefty fee. I haven't had that, but I guess it's pretty good. So use of resources is an important story of human adaptation to different kinds of landscapes. As, cult as landscapes are changing, the ice is melting, Animals were disappearing. How did the humans adapt to those changes as well? So that was an early indication of human use of the valley. Twelve years ago, at Woodburn High School, they were enlarging the parking lot. One of the science teachers was walking into the school and saw a cut bank, a disturbed ground, and saw a large bone. That also turned out to be an ice age animal. It was also a mammoth. 
At that site, they found sloth, the large bear, the big wolves. They found a bird with a 16-foot wingspan, the largest ever recorded anywhere, right in this valley. And there they found indications of some more stone tools. So they brought in, from Oregon State University, the early man investigation team, early human investigation team, they should be called, with their moon suits on so they don't contaminate with human D DNA anything they're looking for. They're looking for DNA to try to figure out, get a b better marker of when things happen. And they're looking for hair. Of course, they're looking for women's hair because it's more stable than men's. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And they found two of them and did the DNA, mitochondrial DNA regression sequencing and got a date of when those two women's hairs were deposited in that site, which had been a spring. Once again, you're hunting animals near water. At the end of an ice age, where's all the water? In the ice. It's dry, so springs are more viable. So that you find the old springs, that's where you want to find the remains of that human activity hunting. And the, and the regression sequencing determined those two women's hairs were laid down in that wet soil matrix 12,000 years ago. 12,400 plus or minus. So when I ask the tribes, when I go talk to the descendants of the Kalapuyans today re residing in Grand Round or Silettes or a few in Warm Springs, confederated reservations, ask them, how long have you folks been here? When did your ancestors come? And they say, we've been here forever. Which, of course, is hard to measure scientifically. But it's getting easier because now we're back to 12,000 years ago in the Willamette Valley. They have found west of Eugene food processing locations that go back 11,000 years. And now the oldest state in the state of Oregon is at Paisley Cave in south central Oregon at 14,400. Some of you have been with me on my tour of Cascadia Cave. A few of you have been on that tour. I'm going again in a couple weeks. Alan's coming with me. Carpool with him. <laughs> Wednesday the 17th, meet at 10 o'clock. Cascadia State Park, bring your boots, it could be raining, bring a lunch, bring a camera, no videos. We're going on to private property, the Hill family land. You can't go there without me or the Hill family from Canada or going with the tribes. We have an agreement with, between the federal government and the Hill family to allow administrative presence at that site. At that location, when I went to college, they told me that was 8,000 years old because they found a charcoal date there. But now we've done the obsidian studies Science is a great thing for answering questions. You take a rock of volcanic glass, obsidian, break it in two, you've exposed a new surface to the air from that point on. It starts absorbing moisture out of the air, and now we can measure with microscopes how much water has been absorbed into that new surface and get a relative date of when that tool was manufactured. So they've done that now and with the collections from Cascadia Cave and Dr. Paul Baxter, who lives in Brownsville, has concluded that that, that site is 11,400 years old right up on the South San Juan River. So we're getting a better idea how long people were here and what the heck they were doing. Linguists who study the Kalapuya language groups have helped us a little bit too. How many were here? in the Willamette Valley. Kalapuyans lived in the Willamette Valley. Willamette Valley is the size of Puerto Rico. Who's been to Puerto Rico? Rich cultural history, isn't it? And great plants there, exciting plants. And the Fountain of Youth is there. I found it when I was there doing some work. You went there too. It's exciting. But we have 14 bands of Kalapuyans <coughs> in the Willamette Valley from Oregon City at the falls, was the be beginning uh, to the north of their territory, because north of the falls of Oregon City, the Lemmet Falls, and along the Columbia River for 200 miles was the greatest trading nation in the Northwest, the Chinook, who took 70-foot ocean-going canoes from Oregon to Canada on trading missions, loaded down 
with all kinds of interesting goodies. Foods, materials, stone tools, trade goods that came from over the Rocky Mountains on the Columbia River system. So that was an intact market. The Kalapuya interfaced with them at Willamette Falls. So beginning there, you had the Kalapuya peoples. You had 14 bands of them, kind of like watershed councils. Up every kind of prim primary tributary of the Willamette was a Kalapuya band. Same, same structure. You could lay it right down over the top of it. They had the first watershed councils. Three language groups, Northern Kalapuyan, Tualatin, Yamhill Kalapuyan language group. In the middle here, some tribes and some scientists think the richest of the Kalapuya groups was the Santiam Kalapuya. And to the south, they, split, they had a Yonkala Kalapuya dialect, Eugene and south. The linguists study those three language dialects, North, Central, and Southern Kalapuyan group, and they can determine through linguistic studies when language groups separated based on the differences in, in dialect and syntax and structure. They concluded that the, those three language groups had been separate in the Willamette Valley for at least 6,500 years. So when you look at the pioneers' stories of who was here and what was going on, it's really in contrast with what we are learning from both the archaeology and the linguistic studies. If you look at the studies that were, the papers that were written down 100 years ago by people who were trying to study what was happening to the Indians and trying to capture some of the stories because the tribes were disappearing so quickly from disease, they just didn't have any way to fight off malaria, primarily here. Malaria killed most of them. Measles got a few. Malaria was a bad situation. Malaria came down the valley in 1830. And the tribes had had smallpox earlier, but it impacted about 30% of them. So in 1830, the malaria came down. 1830, 31, and 32, the three waves of malaria in August of those three years, killed 95% of the people. So folks were trying to understand, and that's before most of the, what? The Europeans, the pioneers, the settlers, thank you, had arrived in the early 1830s because the Great Migration came on beginning in the 1840s. Well, Joe Meek was here in the late 1830s, our first marshal, and some of the great Rocky Mountain trappers had come in. But the majority of people who were settling this part of the world were later than the 1840s. And they wondered what was going on. So they saw some remnants of cultural practices. They saw some of the Indian camps. They saw stone bowls. I'm too old to carry around a full stone bowl anymore, but here's half of a small one. Not real portable. You wouldn't leave this where you're going to use it repeatedly, wouldn't you? You don't carry this around. You don't have a vehicle. You don't have a horse here. Your little dogs they had were kind of camp dogs for hunting and watch dogs. That's half of a bowl. The whole thing on the back of a little dog would be a lot. So they saw some stone bowls. They found some large implements, stone implements of various kinds. And they started to get a feel for what was going on. And they saw a recorded in this area 140 large raised mounds by 1923. Horner and Margeson, Margeson's family from this area, and Horner from East Linn County and then Oregon State recorded 140 mounds along the river systems here. And they thought they were ritually prepared, prepared mounds for burials and platform rituals. And there are other fanciful interpretations as well. We now know That was grandmother's garden. I want to thank the 500 generations of Kalapuya grandmothers for tending this valley with such care and having be such a having such a bountiful harvest for the people for so long. Ever have a raised bed in your garden? Drains quickly, easy to work, isn't it? 
plenty of room for the plants to thrive. Those 140 mounds were raised dead camas mounds. You see camas along the roadsides, don't you? The purple flowers in the spring and the ditches and between Sweet Home and Lebanon, you look off to the either side of the road and you see those beautiful, it's not the wild iris. This comes up before the iris. It's about this tall. You dig up the camas. You would have had purple flowers up on top up here. You dig down in the dirt and you get your food. Complex carbohydrates. People don't need protein alone, do they? You have to have some carbohydrates. These were hunters and gatherers. But they also tended the landscape to provide for their needs. It turns out, when we look at hunters and gatherers, I like to switch it around and say, actually, let's call them gatherers and hunters. 90% of the food base came from the gathering. 10% was the hunters. But hunting is what? It's very manly. It's exciting, isn't it? It's challenging. In fact, we now think that hunting may not have been exclusively the activity of men, that women who have better endurance than men over the long haul ran the game to into a capture point, and the men saved their energy for the kill. And then the grandmother, very good, right? And, and it's killing. And then who gets hurt? The men get hurt because they have to do the killing. There's more risk involved with that. But then who was left? The women to bear the children and keep the families going. So we want to thank the grandmothers for their work. There wasn't rice here. There wasn't corn here. There wasn't wheat here. We didn't have potatoes. From where did potatoes come? Peru, of course. From different parts of the world. But when Oregon State University School of Agriculture tested the complex carbohydrates, and they tested camas against those others, camas rated out right at the top. For the amount of energy it takes to harvest it and traditionally prepare it in exchange for the nutrition that you receive is an excellent food source. So they would dig it up. Now, they didn't have shovels. This is Sakai's way of shovel. I call her Sakai. I have 11 names for her. Most of you know her as Sacagawea. This is replicated from William Clark's drawing of her digging stick. Handy, comes apart, put it in your bag, carry it with you. Pull it out, put it together when it's time to dig. It's not a pick. Pretty good back scratcher. <laughs> <laughs> it's a probe. In those mounds where the soil is loose and dried out, you dig down and you flip the bulbs up. I dug those bulbs with this digging stick. Made of elk antler. And ocean spray, a little bit fire hardened, it works pretty well. Now, so you have your camas bulbs. You can't live with salmon and elk meat alone. Here's a bunch of the camas bulbs right here. They're dried up a little bit. If you go and eat these bulbs without properly preparing them, you'll be given the gift <laughs> of gastronomic distress, <laughs> which will remain legendary in your family for decades quite unpleasant. But if you roast it and change the chemical composition, it's extremely digestible. It comes out like a roasted pear. It's pretty good. It's, it's nice. So what they would do is they would roast them up. They would dig. OK, here we go. Somewhere I've got my teaching aid. Dig a hole in the ground the size of one of these tables, six to eight foot long, three, three feet wide, lining with rocks. Well, the fire and heat those rocks up, you need heat to cook things, don't you? You, you dig this on the side of your mound where you've dug all your camas up, you 
for, with your grandmother. Grandmother tells you when to dig and where to dig, of course. And you have baskets and baskets of the camas bulbs waiting to be roasted. And of course, because the mounds are all along the river system, what has coyote done for you? Coyote, the forces of nature. Where is coyote? Coyote, or coyote, or unless you're from South America, they say coyote. Coyote provides all the firewood you need. So the kid's job is to gather up the firewood, build the fire in the pit, he superheat those rocks up. I didn't bring Vanna with me today. And you line the hot rocks with leaves and grasses, put all your camas bulbs in it, put more leaves and grasses on top of the bulbs, rocks on top of that, and build a fire. And the kid's job is to keep that fire going for 72 hours. And you change the earth into an oven, and you've cooked your camas, and you're ready to go. When we excavate into those mounds, do scientific investigations to what was happening and looking for remnants of past cultural activity, we find firecracked stones. We find all kinds of bits of charcoal from the, the ovens, and we find the lined pits. And they're not constructed mounds. If there are platform mounds built for ritual ceremonies or living structures, people thought, well, they'd build their houses on top of the mounds so they'd be up out of the flooding in the Willamette Valley. That was one theory. Then if you dug through the mound, you would have no cultural material if they brought all the dirt in there. And some of these mounds are big. Over by Tangent, there's one of the mounds. The road, the county built a road right through it. The artifacts bleed out of the cut banks. That mound is 600 feet long, 200 feet wide, and 10 feet high. That's a lot of camas. That's a lot. That takes thousands of years to build something like that. When we excavate into that, we find that cultural deposits indicate accretional use. Instead of just constructed, it's layer upon layer upon layer all the way through of cultural use and activity, cooking, living, sleeping, all the things people did. Made a few tools. Stone bowls are there because that's where you want them. You're not carrying your stone bowl off into the woods with it very much. So you put your cooked camas bulbs in your stone bowl, pound it up into a paste, kind of like mashed potatoes. And because every family has their own recipe, like your grandmother makes chocolate chip cookies different than mine, right? And whatever it is. Gravy is different, probably. Mm -hmm. The tea is, everything is a little bit different. Different families had their own recipes for the chemist production. And they were making their primary trade item. Trade was the basis for the economies in the, in the Northwest. When Alexander Henry came to the Pacific Northwest, he was a Scottish observer in the ships. He said, the Indian peoples here in the Pacific Northwest are different than we've seen before. In the Southeast and the Southwest and the Great Plains, there was a lot of competition. There was horses and they had access to firearms earlier. He said, in the Pacific Northwest, relationships between Indian peoples are based on commerce, not conflict. These were market analysts traders, producers, marketers, buyers and sellers, and consumers. Why would that work so well in the Northwest compared to the Great Plains and the Southwest and to some extent the Southeast? Because we live in an area of natural abundance. Great rainfall, the Willamette Valley, think about the Willamette Valley. The Kalapuyans, what a paradise temperate climate, long growing season, thanking the Montana floods, Missoula floods for giving us all their topsoil, fantastic soil. Extremes 
and not too frequent moderating conditions. Dependability. Sustainability, if you tend the land properly and your grandmother's burned it all off to encourage the plants to grow and re return. Sustainability brings security. They had a very sustainable, very secure landscape. So everybody in the Northwest, the different groups, would develop a niche for trade. And the Santiam Kalapuya right here were master producers of the camas trade. 140 of those large raised mounds. That's a lot of camas. One of those mounds would be more, would be a couple of semi loads full of camas bulbs, easily. So they'd pound it up into a paste, and then each grandmother would get the family together and add their own signature ingredients into the mix for trade. There are 12 kinds of berries available for harvest in the Willamette Valley alone. There's wild cherry, wild plum, wild apples here, the crab apples. Those are pruned by the tribes to enhance the bounty and the harvest. You take those fruits, you take the acorns, the hazelnuts, pound them all up into, into your paste with your camas, and you have your signature recipe. Now for nutrition, you can add other things too, roots and salmon oil. And they made cakes like the size of dinner plate cookies, the size, cookies the size of a dinner plate an inch or two inches thick. They're known as the California trading wheels. The Europeans saw them being traded up at, into the Chinook trading empire at Willamette Falls. So they're on the record. And they added, for extra nutrition, after they would torch the prairies off, one of the kids' jobs was to go out and gather up the roasted grasshoppers. Who's eating roasted grasshoppers? Oh, they're quite tasty. <laughs> We're doing a restoration project with the two tribes up on the South San Diego. We've been burning for 18 years on the camas field. And we brought back 300% increase in the camas. And after we burn it off, we go out with the kids and the grandmothers and eat the roasted grasshoppers. I don't recommend the praying mantises. <laughs> they don't crisp up quite as, they're kind of gooey sometimes. You know. <laughs> they were manufacturing for trade the Northwest first power bars. The other thing for which the Californians were known in the commercial world was their production and trade of medicine. The Lamet Valley produced 75 different medicines at least from all the plants that were here. The roots, the bark, the leaves, the fruits, Many kinds of medicine we use. When I go interview tribal folks, South Central Oregon and Northern California, Southeastern Washington, I say, for what you, are your ancestral stories about those Californians? What, did they, what, did, what happened between your folks? And your grandmother's 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 stories about the Californians, and they say, well, everybody knew they made the food, but they were medicine people. They came there to be doctored, and they came there trade for medicine. I do have, people will donate things to you. Be ready. Even, and I don't have a museum, I just have a, you know, a teaching collection under my drafting table at work in my office. Medicine stones, old ones, grandmother's medicine stones. I pass them around. You can feel the love and feel the medicine and power in these stones. You won't find a smoother stone anywhere in the world than that. Those have been ground up medicine trade. There were Indian doctors that, that practiced. There's two kinds of illnesses for the Kalapuyans. Physical illness and spiritual disorder. We have, not uncommon today. We have psychiatrists and physicians. The shaman dealt with your spiritual and psychological problems. And they would heal you. But the grandmothers made the medicine that tended the body's needs. It worked out pretty well. They would trade medicine and trade camas north into the Chinook world 
And the Chinooks were rich. They trade, they took <laughs> canoe loads of trade goods, armor from boiled elk skins that would stop an arrow. It was highly prized in Canada. They would trade for those Klamans vests that were armored in Canada. And they traded for the Indian money. And everybody knows they scarcity drives value, and adornment is a part of displaying who you are. So the Kalapuyans used shells for adornment, bones for adornment, seeds and pieces of wood. They tattooed themselves. Women tattooed their, from the chin down the neck, tell their family story, and the men had tattoos on their arms, talking about who they were. But this was not the money. You traded items. They would trade, cal trade their Kalapuya medicine and their <coughs> camas cakes east to the Molala, their neighbors who controlled the obsidian pearls. This is a Molala $100 bill. It's worth a lot down here in the Kalapuya world. Kalapuya is also traded. This is a Kalapuya $20 bill. Crypto crystal and silica right out of the river. Not as sharp as obsidian, the black stone, the glass. The glass is better for penetrating body cavities and cutting because it's so sharp. But this is durable, 10 times more resistant. For working antler, bone, and wood, this is what you want. So it had its value too, so the Kalapuya traded that. But this was the ultimate currency. This is the shell money. They would trade, the Kalapuyas traded their goods north near the Chinook world for the Haikwa, the Dentilia shells, the shell money off the southeast coast of Vancouver Island. The Nootka tribe harvested these shells. Each shell, I'll get the big ones, you can see them better. These are worth four times as much individually, these big ones. Each one of these shells had a little animal in it, a little mollusk. The feet came out the big end, like a, it's like a trumpet, it's hollow. The antenna came out the top. And you take the animal out and they string together really nicely, don't they? So it's pretty good. So 40 of them, this is a strand of 40, this little strand, was worth one 26-foot Chinook River canoe. They were highly valuable because they were so scarce. They didn't wash up on the beach. They didn't have little colonies they tended and harvested. And these critters lived at 100 feet deep in the dark Pacific cold ocean floor of Vancouver Island where the water is cold. They don't have any way to dive that deep. There's no artificial light down there. How do you harvest them? Well, the Nootka figured it out. They made harvesting brooms. They would stand on the front of their canoe and they had like a, like a, like a push broom, the broom head, a wide one, with a collapsible head of whittled, carved little fingers of yew wood and cedar, and with extendable handles, they would screw them in and push that broom head down 100 feet. And then through a series of weights and releases, they had stones on the sides of that cedar plank that they had. <coughs> cedar plank coming down from the top with ropes. You've got some large rocks bigger than this on the, on the, on the two sides of it. And you've got your broom head sticking out through the bottom. And then you release the plank and the weights push plank down and it closes up the broom head and picks up your hiko off the bottom of the ocean floor. Those broom heads have survived in Canada in their museum. They're telling quite a story there. As you could tell the story of the camas here or the medicine, either one. Of course, this is my strand that I wear when I'm feeling really good. It's my own personal power. All right, those Kalapuyans were something, weren't they? They were 
not very large people, not as large as the Chinook. Men would come to, to my shoulder, women were about halfway down to my elbow. Darker than the Chinook, dark, darker complexion than many of the tribes in the Northwest. Straight black hair. Strong, good in the water, good on their feet, good with their hands, and they had great rhythm because there was a lot of pounding going on. They're pounding their food in their stone bowls. They're pounding their roots, pounding up their acorns into mush, pounding their hazelnuts into meal, pounding up the grasshoppers, pounding the meat to make pemmican, pounding the salmon. There's a lot of pounding. And they're pounding the plants. Here we go. The number one plant for the Kalapuya was the western red cedar. It counts as a plant, it's a tree. Cedar bark, very good stuff. You can do all kinds of things with it. Great house planks, shingles for your houses. But when Lewis and Clark came down the Columbia River, Patrick Gass, the sergeant who was in charge of construction of their forts, said, look, I can't believe it. It's the first wooden houses we've seen in 3,000 miles. The Indians didn't have teepees out here because of the rain. They lived in wooden houses made out of cedar. And they had roof panels out of cedar bark. You peel the bark, dry it flat on the river banks. It comes out straight, flat, and it's very lightweight. It's very nice to have. And when it's time to light your fire, you go up and you untie the, the cordage which holds the bark panels in place, move them aside, and you've got your smoke hole so your smoke doesn't fill up your house with obnoxious smoke. It's not good at all. You take the bark off the tree. They would come up to the cedar trees and say a prayer. Thank you, Grandmother Cedar, for sharing your dress with us. Strip the bark off. Chop with their stone tools. Oh, this is another hand axe here. This one came right out of the South San Juan River. Look at that one. Ready to go to work, aren't you? Yeah. Do some chopping. Chop into the tree, cut the bark loose. In the right time of the year, you strip the bark off. I talked with Stephanie Wood. Stephanie Craig, her name is now, she got married. She's a basket maker from Grand Round last month. And this year, she got a 40-foot cedar peel off a big tree. That's a, that's a big peel. She was pretty happy about that. The bark is good for house components, of course, like I said. But if you strip the bark into, cut it into long strips, it becomes useful for other things as well. Get this bear grass out of the middle of it, we'll be okay. Bear grass for basketry. You soak the cedar bark into strips. You can weave it together and make baskets. You can make mats, utility mats, hats. What did they cook in? They didn't have metal, did they? They didn't have pottery here. You could cook it. Cook, you could cook in a stone bowl, I suppose, if you could carry it around, but they're too heavy. So you left your stone bowls for your processing your camas down in the valley or some other medicine plant processing locations where they're not portable. They wove together cedar bark baskets so tightly that when you added water to it and put your cooking stones into the basket full of water, it warmed up the water and swelled the bark watertight. <coughs> they had cooking baskets which were lightweight, easy to transport, and if it gets burned up or something or it gets destroyed, what happens? Yes! There's plenty of cedar bark out in the foothills, isn't there? That's where you want to go. So the bark gives you all kinds of uses. The Wilkes expedition in 1841 also showed Kalapuya women wearing cedar bark skirts, kind of like mini skirts, short skirts in the summertime. Kind of scratchy, wouldn't you think? But it turns out if you pound the bark, there's a lot of pounding going on here, pounding. If you pound the bark and soak it repeatedly, it comes out like a 
a cotton shirt, it's so soft. And if you don't want to go to all that work, what do you do? Put the bark in your driveway in the rain all winter and drive over it in your car. And you replicate the softness quickly. There's other ways to do it as well. So you chop into this cedar tree. And you get your house planks. Well, the house planks were much bigger than this, but this fits in the back of the rig. I can transport it around. Imagine this being this wide and eight foot tall on the ends of the houses, on the sides of the houses, excuse me, and up to 16 foot tall on the ends of the houses. They had regular roofs like our roofs. Get your plank out. It's not all that light. It's not too bad. This is a rough plank. You get your woodworking tools. There you go. There's your hand axe again, right? Like I adds. Plane it down. This is a finished house plank for a demonstration made by a Kalapuya elder. There's still around a few of them. And they're still working. And if you come on the 17th to my tour in the Cascadia Cave at Cascadia State Park, I've invited a couple of tribal elders to see if they show up. But this is the finished plank where they smooth it down. This would be the inside of the house, tapered on the two ends so it fits into grooved headers and footer logs. And you just slide your planks together, slide your house together. When it's time to move the village downstream, they had the village sites along the rivers every three to five years to have a new location. You just take it all apart like a big puzzle, float it down the river, and reassemble it downstream. This one is smoothed out with stones and then oiled. On the, in the coastal areas, and up north on the Columbia, they used whale oil. In, in here, they used bear oil to smooth it out. People wonder why I have the glass beads with me in this display. There's not very many. I have enormous glass bead collection for teaching in Lewis and Clark, because that's a big part of that story. Well, they didn't have glass beads here, did they? No. Europeans brought them with them. This just is a little teaser to talk about the end of the days when the European contact happened. And one of the things that the tribes found so attractive, they had family patterns. Each family had its own color design. The primary colors for design were what in the Indian world? White, red, yeah. red yeah. black, and yellow. Blue was what they wanted. Blue was the one color they couldn't make in their native dyeing process. So when the Europeans showed up with glass beads, which they could reproduce their family patterns, instead of in porcupine quills, which they'd always used before by dyeing the porcupine quills, they, they could be torn up and broken pretty easily. The glass beads are very durable, so they loved the glass beads. And the tie blue beads were the most highly prized. And within 10 years of European contact, the blue beads replaced the haikwa. It was the money exchanged. So 40 blue beads replaced the 40 shell, Ventilia shell haikwa money. What happens when you get into eco economics? Inflation, of course. And the tr trading ship showed up just like the bankers with so many blue beads that they became worthless and the tribes went back to their haikwa, one of the few times in history of cultural interchange. Well, that's another story you could tell right there. It would be a good one. There was a trader named Quamach. The Europeans got his name. He traded up and down the Limit Valley, and he, he made sure that goods were moving in the 1820s and 1830s. And he took loads with porters, people that carried them in backpacks out of cedar and basketry and hazelnut, hazel woven baskets that carried large loads up to the big trading markets in along the Chinook trading empire along the Columbia River. And the most powerful trader with whom the Kalapuya dealt with was the son of the great king Kamkamu, who ruled the whole Chinook Empire out of the Astoria area, 200 miles of the Columbia River to the Dalles, 
40,000 Indians, the richest, most powerful tribe in North America, north of the Aztecs, you could argue, or the Chinook. And his son lived in what's now Vancouver, Washington. And he was the great trader for the Columbia interface with the Kalapuyan trading empire. But medicine, a few stone tools, and the uh, Camas trade. He's known today by many of us with a different inflection in his name. His name was Casino, a casino. <laughs> Gambling was a huge part of the Kalapuya world. And who controlled the gambling? The grandmothers. The grandmothers had a lot of power. It's true, many of the head people, they didn't really have chiefs, but the head persons were men. It's true, many of the shaman who had great influence were men, but there were women head persons and there were women shamans, many actually, in this area. We're gonna talk about that in great depth going into Cascadia Cave, so if you want to see the other side of their spiritual world, come on that day. It's pretty interesting, so bring your boots. But the grandmothers held the council of advice that the leaders consulted before important decisions were made. And before they gave their advice, they sang their gambling songs and they gambled. And they knew from that experience what Coyote had intended for that day based on the expressions of their good fortune and good luck. Now, how do you think Coyote becomes such an important figure? Coyote was their trickster, their changer, their change agent who made the world of today. After the old world disappeared and collapsed, there was nothing left. Coyote pops up, misses the first world, starts making the world of today out of the flesh of Mother Earth and blowing Tuanamas or the spirit power of life into everything that is in the world of today. That's why we say the Kalapuyans had a kin-centric world view. They're kin, they're related to everything because the same act of creation from the great trickster to spiritual metaphor to the great creator this happened to be Coyote because Coyote's kind of the tricky one, created their world. And so they see their cousins to the plants and the rocks. So we refer to the, how they interacted with the world. It goes something like this. They had a kin-centric, place-based, everybody's in charge of an area, intergenerational, grandmothers are in charge, tending, of the wild, we managed, they tended, that's an important distinction. Guided by the grandcestors, that's my word, resulting in a traditional cultural landscape mosaic of calculated abundance. That's a story. Okay, that's it for today. Paul said 40 minutes and I went longer, I'm sorry. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's give a big hand. Too many stories to tell. <laughs>